This is the KJ Show. The KJ Show with host Dr. Katherine Johnson is a mix of breaking news and practical advice on the many ways in which the energy industry can affect you and your family. Catherine will combine energy updates and conversations with leaders in the energy efficiency community. So please welcome your host, Dr. KJ. Hello and welcome to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson. You're on the Bold Brave TV network listening and watching the KJ Show. Today, I want to talk about something that is sort of becoming more insidious. It's the heating versus eating uh, discussion that we seem to be having. Now, normally that's reserved for senior citizens on fixed incomes who have to worry about whether or not they can, you know, pay for their medications or heat their house or eat their food, right? But actually it's become a lot more than that. Now we're actually in a struggle under the name of environmentalism and global warming and greenhouse gas emissions to really start wondering, and people are starting to say, you know, what we eat has a bad environmental consequences. Therefore, not only do we have to change the way we fuel our homes, not using fossil fuels, but we also have to change and modify our diets. Or do we? That's the issue that I want to talk about today. So we're going to talk about the, the push for controlling greenhouse gas emissions. Are they going to go after our food? And the answer is that that's what people are trying to do. They're trying to take away our corn and our lamb and our pork and our rice even. Um, but anyway, before we get too started on that path, um, in the next segment, I wanted to start with talking about some of the stuff that I always think I'm going to run out of things to say. And then, no, it doesn't happen. And even though I've talked about these things in the past, the news keeps happening. It's continuing to occur. So now there's even more bad examples of environmentalism or green energy causing environmental damage. Um, apparently the green energy's growth has actually led to a mounting problem for recycling. And as the industry expands, a uh, new problem emerges. What are they going to do with the results of the waste? And I've talked about this before with the solar, but also wind panels. Um, more than 90% of discarded solar panels end up in landfills simply because it's cheaper to do that than recycling. Um, okay, and that's and by they think by 2030, the panels are going to estimate to cover equivalent of 3,000 football fields. And we're supposed to be doing this for the benefit of the environment. We're actually creating really noxious uh, pollution. And I've talked about how the dangers of that. And this, most of this stuff, unfortunately, ends up in Africa. The wind industry, though, is also facing some recycling challenges. And you know why? Because wind turbines are designed to not be recycled. They're designed to be resilient. They're designed to operate in all kinds of conditions. So the wind turbines are actually producing 47 million tons of blade waste, they think, by 2050. But the massive blades built and withstand all kinds of conditions are a recycling challenge. And that they really don't know what to do with these wind blades solar once they, you know, no longer work or fall off. Um, so they've they've started to do some recycling of wind blades, but it's really a very small, very sm small part because it's simply not economical enough yet to do it. So recycling is on the horizon, maybe. Um, and then I know another update. I talked about EVs a few weeks ago, and so here's a new one. The uh, according to in Wales. The electric vehicle charging policy in Wales is actually becoming what they call an embarrassment. Um, they have only, a Wales has 11,000 11, battery charged EVs, but only 700 and 7,800 plug-ins. So they have about 20,000 cars that could actually benefit from an EV charging station, but they've only got one charger per 15,000 people. And there's only 2,400 total in Wales. Now, Wales was supposed to set the, the standard for what we're going to do. We're going to make Wales a coal country, right, into EV charging, except they haven't gotten around to putting in the charging stations. Again, leaving people without the infrastructure to actually move towards EVs. Very dangerous. Um, and they basically said it's an embarrassment. And another embarrassment, and this is actually quite um, relevant to our show today, is a few weeks ago, I talked about how the Dutch government wanted to actually try and eliminate farming because it produces too much methane, and we'll get into that a little bit more today. Um, but apparently, the Dutch government lost an election. The farmers won. They actually, farmers won, were big winners, and they gained 15 out of 75 
seats, and they're now the largest force, largest political bloc in their in their legislative chambers. And so they had created the government had created this twenty two billion dollar program to buy to buy farmers out, and the whole goal is to actually help the farmers stop producing and growing food because of the methane greenhouse gas emissions that farming produces. The Dutch party prime minister said that he wants to renegotiate this by 2050, 30, because apparently the farmers aren't quite on board. And they're sort of like wondering, well, what if they sell out all the farms? Who's going to grow? Where are they going to get their food? Pressure is lo- from the looming deadline has pushed the solution farther away. Netherlands farming counts for 46% of its total emissions. It also probably pr- counts for about 100% of its food, certainly cheese. It's really good cheese in the Netherlands. They wanted to cut nitrogen emissions by getting rid of farmers and farms, but they don't really know how they're going to do that. Isn't that always the way it goes? Let's have a policy and then figure out how to implement it. But I don't think getting rid of your farmland in a country as small as Netherlands is really going to really help you out much. And we'll, and, and I have a lot more on that later on today. And then the one thing that really just sort of kind of annoys me more than anything is we have all this pressure, right, to cut down on our greenhouse gas emissions, and we're supposed to do this. That's why we have to get rid of farmers. That's why we have to stop eating meat. That's why we have to do all these different things. Well, you know what? Guess who is the largest greenhouse gas emissions country in the world? China. But where China doesn't seem to be cutting back on its lifestyle. In fact, China has over a thousand coal plants that they're running, more than half of the world's capacity. But yet, they're the world's largest emitter of, um, of greenhouse gases. In fact, they emit more greenhouse gases than the entire developed world combined. So we're supposed to make all these changes and have all these environmental, you know, we're supposed to move to car, you know, EVs, and we're supposed to cut back on our, our greenhouse gas emissions, and we're supposed to worry about methane. But China doesn't seem to have those same issues, right? And they get, and they basically are getting away with it. Um, the study group, you know, it's a Washington think tank, said that China emitted 27% of the greenhouse gases in 2019. And that was 2019. And the U.S. was the second with 11%. Well, we're half of China, even less than half. While India was a third with 6%. Yes, but we're India and China and the United States are all pretty big countries, right? But China's double us in triple or quadruple India. Scientists warned that without an agreement between U.S. and China to, you know, to get these emissions in control, under control, it's going to be hard to stop climate change. And that the Chinese emissions have also tripled over the last three decades. So if the Chinese emissions have have, tri- have tripled, um, then it's very scary to say, well, why are they allowed to build coal plants and not have the consequences that we are here facing in the developed world? It's an interesting question, isn't it? And we'll continue. But it is very scary to think that we have to make all these lifestyle changes and China continues to build power plants. Should be an interesting day. Um, okay, so we're gonna. I'm on Catherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. Uh, this you're watching the KJ Show, and we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery, or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. 
published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, Hope, and Support for Caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation and welcome back to the kj show sorry for that technical delay um live television is always a challenge isn't it but today i've been talking about oh by the way you're this is the kj show i'm dr katherine johnson your host on the bold brave tv network and thank you for coming back and sticking with me so to speak so today i've actually been talking about heating versus eating and it's mo gone way below beyond just a slogan that's used during political campaigns it's actually becoming a concern and I came across some really interesting articles in the Economist magazine now I'm gonna to have to give the credit to the Economist for some of the things I'll talk about later in the show but I want to point out that this is not ideas coming from me just dr. Katherine Johnson out of the blue these are actually articles that are coming from all kinds of experts and intellectuals and scientists and the scary thing is that now there the Economist has pointed out and they did a whole article on this where they're basically going to go to war on rice. Now, rice is a staple crop, crop for about 5 billion people. But apparently rice not only causes diabetes in Western diets, except not in Japan, but they also apparently now are worried that rice causes, wait for it, 
global warming. Uh, climate change, um, global rice demand in Africa and Asia continues to increase, but the production yields are coming down. And the reason is they're saying is, is because of climate change, there's flooding, the, there's been um, all kinds of different rising temperatures that are causing problems in producing rice. But is that bad? Because rice, according to the economist article, is actually bad for the planet. Rice cultivation is suffering from both and causing, suffering from and causing global warming. Rice paddies emit a lot of methane, a potent greenhouse gas, and that the crop fueling this rise of 60% of the world's population is becoming a source of insecurity and threat. So now 5 billion people rely on rice as their main staple, but it's also becoming, causing global climate change because of the rice paddies, the way it's grown. So a but if you think about this, this is a really scary statistic, again, from The Economist that says rice cultivation generates more greenhouse gases than pork, lamb, poultry, and mutton dairy production combined. So this means that rice, cultivating rice, is more damaging to the environment than eating pork, beef, no, pork, poultry, lamb, mutton, and dairy. Well, I guess we don't have to get rid of our cows for milk yet, right? Um, rice consideration has two environmental impacts, methane emissions and water usage. They have one of the smallest footprints in terms of per ton of protein, meaning rice doesn't have a lot of protein, right? Um, but it's much more efficient than any animal-based food. However, growing it causes tiny microbes in flooded rice paddies to produce methane, which may be omitted into the atmosphere may be omitted into the atmosphere. So there's this project um, called that Drawdown that says rice cultivation is responsible for about 10% of the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, and that shifting rice production um, could actually reduce methane. But last week I talked about how methane was being generated in the North Carolina wetlands, and it was actually a good thing. The other thing that I have to get into in a future show is the fact that methane is considered a short-term gas, not a long-term, like carbon dioxide, so it's actually not as harmful, maybe, a topic for another day. But the problem is rice is now becoming a source of global concern. But meanwhile, there's an increased demand for rice. The rising demand exasperates the, exacerbates the problem, and they think by 2050, there'll be 5.3 billion people in Asia up from 4 billion today and 2 billion in Africa. So they think that that's how many people are going to be needing to eat, wanting to eat rice. But rice productivity is falling due to the climate and the way it's grown and the flooding. And that they said it's actually the yields are coming down. So we have a higher demand for rice, yields are coming down, perhaps global, war global, global warming, climate impacts. And unfortunately, the, dropest, the sharpest drop in rice cultivation is where? Southeast Asia. But if they don't increase their yields, then these poor countries may actually be out of food. So this is quite the conundrum, right? Who knew? I mean, I like rice, but who knew? So what they're trying to do is figure out a strategy to help re uh, address this threat. So they're, they're talking about that. Uh, this Economist article pointed out that um, rising sea levels are causing all kinds of damage. It's vulnerable to climate change and that the rice contribution to global warming represents an unappreciated feedback of the loop. Irrigating the paddy field, rice fields actually starves the uh, soil of oxygen, which incurs methane and creates all these problems. So rice is responsible you know, for a lot of methane. I hear different numbers all the time. The point is that 15% of the greenhouse gas emissions is, is, is what they think is, in Viet is comparable to the entire Vietnam's transportation system emissions. So it's a big deal, right? Rice apparently is bad for the for the uh, global warming and it's apparently bad for us too, but is it really? And now they're looking at and the, one of the strategies they come up with because I don't really want to be, you know, a doomsday person and I'm actually not. They're actually now trying to figure out how to, you know, breed better rice, uh, better grains of rice, you know, better loving through biological God knows what, uh, diversity or gen genetically modified foods. So what they're trying to do is the scientists are trying to develop alternative strains of rice where they can t reduces the tillage and is more drought resistant and has emits less methane. They're trying to produce a lower methane <laughs> for grain of rice. 
and also various practices to help when the fields are flooded. But that comes with a trade-off too, um, because it can also increase nitrous oxide emissions. So if you don't have floods, if you don't reduce the floods, you're going to create an increase of NOx. So it seems like no matter what we're going to get, whether what other strategies we come up with, it's going to have yield some other unintended consequence. So overall research shows that the systems like um, they want to do alternative wetting and drying. It's a it's a food it's a rotation sort of thing that they they think it might actually help, but as long as they don't use too much fertilizer. So they have these solutions out there. The other problem is they've been trying, you know, to introduce experimental varieties of rice in these countries. But in Bangladesh, they were growing a flood tolerant rice. They, and, you know, they that worked. That had a higher percent profits and yields. Um, but they also said that, um, and they also said that this drought resistant rice actually requires less land. But the farmers are reluctant to change. They don't, they're afraid of trying something new, well, of course, and that Vietnam, no, Vietnam now wants to have, cultivate a low carbon rice on a million hectares um, to promote a way of saving the planet. So Vietnam is going to a low carbon rice, assuming that farmers plant it and assuming that people actually like it and taste good. <sighs> so anyway, um, it's just amazing how we are now looking at energy from a agricultural point of view. And I'll continue this conversation when we get back. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson. You're on the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network, and we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hey, and welcome back to the KJ Show. Hopefully <laughs> you're enjoying the show. Uh, Today we're talking about heating versus eating on the KJ Show at Bold Brave TV Network. I'm your host, Dr. Katherine Johnson. And I've been spoken, mostly my show is focused on energy, but it seems that now energy is spilling into um, agricultural concerns as well, especially when you talk about greenhouse gas emissions. And I've talked about the sheep and the cows and all these different things. And actually Bill Gates is among the investors trying to develop a new breed of cow uh, fuel, uh, cow food that reduces their belching. We'll see how that goes. But um, what I really thought was interesting, and I was talking about The Economist last time, I actually, they actually, in addition to having an article on the war on rice, they've also come up with a new index. I love econ economics because they can come up with all these indices, you know, sort of measure them against a consistent baseline. Kind of what we do in my life, but in my evaluation work. But this one, they actually decided to compare the impacts of climate climate impacts of different food and they tied it to the banana 
A banana is a uh, compares popular foodstuffs on three metrics, weight, calories, and protein. Index to the humble banana, a fruit of middling climate change and nutritional value. So they developed this interactive chart, and I wish I could sort of demonstrate it to you. I have some pictures, but they really basically look at the food that we eat, all kinds of different food, beef, uh, salmon, croissants, peas, and they actually develop a banana score. Basically, say they call it a banana split, where they say, and it comes up to, surprise, surprise, beef is really bad, according to this banana scale, um, and that it, it producing beef, one kilogram of beef, which is like two pounds of ground beef, causes as many emissions as 109 kilograms of bananas. They call it a banana score of 109. But if you adjust for the nutritional value, then the score goes down to 54, because, uh, but it's still one calorie of ground beef causes 54 times as much as carbon emissions as one calorie of a banana. But the protein, it is actually much better. It's seven. So depending on how you look at it, beef is either good or bad for the planet if you, if you just look at it through these different perspectives. And surprise, surprise, they think that poultry, of course, is better for the planet. And in the last segment I just told about how poultry actually it causes less climate global emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, than, say, rice cultivation. Poultry scores 11 bananas by weight and 4 by calorie, but as a source of protein, it's much more carbon friendly than the banana. Poultry emits just three-fifths of the same amount of banana protein. Well, bananas aren't really known for their protein no more, much, are they? Um, and that they say plant-based foods, surprise, do better. A meat-free burger scores one-fifth of the emissions compared to those that are, you know, from our friendly cows. And other plant-based foods like grapes, sugar, and coconut milk contain barely any protein, so they're actually increased scores. So, but the fallacy or the fundamental flaw I found in this metric, and it's really fun to think about banana splits, but really they're really not looking at protein as a critical indicator of, of food. And frankly, we need protein. Um, we really do in our diets. So I went and said, well, maybe I'll um, play around with it. And I came up with two little, I came up with a chart. And the first one estimates the amount, how many carbon emissions by CO2 by weight and by calorie count for donuts. You can't see it, but it's donuts. So donuts are here. So donuts are pretty good for, they, they're pretty high on, on emissions for, by weight. Um, they're lower uh, in emissions by calorie count, which I don't understand. And protein, donuts are really good, except that no one in their right mind would think that a do donut is a good source of protein, um, nor is it a good source of anything. It's, it's a donut. But it's um, according to this scale, it rates better than beef. So I'm thinking, I don't know if you can compare calories, weight, and, and emissions by protein count and somehow think that protein isn't the most important thing we get out of food. Um, it seems a little skewed, maybe. Um, and actually, you know, so this is one of the many ways in which the, uh, the political people are trying to tell us how we should control what we eat, how they're trying to control us, I think. Um, remember Michelle Obama and her lunch school program that that everybody hated, and the kids came up with the song about we were hungry, we want more lunch, and how Michelle Obama really was trying to make sure that we were aware of our calories and all the different menu items. I don't think it really made much of a difference, and frankly, I saw a lot of pictures of Michelle and Barack Obama eating slushies and snow cones and ice creams and hot dogs, so I don't know how much they actually followed their own advice as well. But I always get concerned when politicians try to tell us how we're supposed to eat or what we're supposed to eat. It's very, very worrying, worrisome to me. But there's still this promotion that says that global meat eating is on the rise, which of course, by the way, actually isn't a bad thing. So now we've heard about for years, you know, Meatless Mondays and all those different things. But obviously, guess what? It's actually important for human beings to eat meat. Um, in rich countries, people go to the oat lattes and the vegan stuff and all the sort of, I think, the, 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 the poser type of foods. But in the last decade to 2017, um, global meat consumption has actually increased. 1% uh, almost, and, it's, and dairy is also up, going up 2%. So as 
we get more population and as countries become a little well, poor countries have more resources, guess what? They start eating meat and, and dairy. Um, the Food and the Agricultural Organization, another UN agency, estimates that the global number of livestock, that's ruminant livestock, cattle, buffalo, sheep, goats, all those things, are going to rise to um, $5.8 billion, billion by 2050 under a new business as usual scenario. And that the global population of chickens is going to go to about 23 billion. So they don't see, these, the UN agency doesn't see a decrease in livestock nor a decrease in the demand for chicken or poultry or beef or dairy. So you know why? Because it's good for the local economies. Apparently the rise of meat and dairy eating may be an environmental problem, but it's actually, it's a good for the local economies. It's helping um, actually encourage and bringing nutrition to children, pregnant women, older people, people who need these proteins. And I'll talk even more about that in the next segment. Um, cattle are less efficient, um, so, but they can be farmed differently. And a study of American farm data estimated that calorie for calorie beef production is, requires three times as much as, guess what, pork. So now they're saying that we need to switch more to eating pork. I wonder how the Muslims are going to go for that idea. And uh, pork is apparently considered one of the greenest meats out there because basically they can eat anything and they are very efficient at in converting food feed to, into meat. So that I get a lot, I'm confused. Um, beef is bad, pork is good, donuts are better than beef burgers. I, I don't get it. All I know is I think food is becoming a political tool and that's a worrisome thing for me. And it's under the guise of saving the planet, reducing clim global climate change. But a lot of these things are produced naturally anyway, like methane. So it's an interesting conversation and it's an interesting conundrum. But this, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson. You're on the Bold Brave TV network watching the KJ Show and we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hi, and welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV Network. Today, I'm talking about heating versus eating. I hope some of you can actually, I don't have my friend John commenting this month, week, so I don't even know if I'm going to have any callers. The call-in line is up, though, and I really hope we do have a conversation because, I, you know, I, I like hearing from folks, and if we disagree, that's even better. But if we don't get any callers, don't worry. I have some other funny things to share that I came across in the news just because it's too hard to resist. Um, so everybody had, was all excited about the coronation of King Charles III. And it was a beautiful coronation ceremony. I actually got up really early to watch it because I figure I 
I wasn't around for the first one when last Elizabeth was crowned, and I doubt I'll be around for William's uh, coronation um, unless Charles has a really short reign. So I thought once in my life I'll get to see a coronation, and it was very interesting to me and um, very interesting to see how it's almost like an initiation ceremony and also a religious ceremony, and I thought it was, uh, you know, I, it was, I'm glad we saw it. I'm glad I saw it. But now, you know, Charles has been, King Charles has been promoting climate change worries and he's been alarming he's been very you know, very vocal about global warming and climate action and all these things and he's been very he's been a very green prince pretty much since the 70s i mean this is not something new for prince for king charles but now guess what he wants to do he wants to take his beautiful garden in one of his palaces sandrahim uh, the lawn and he wants to create a giant topiary garden of his childhood and of course, it's climate friendly. So what he's going to do is he's going to create biodiverse formal garden with 10,000 plants. Like, gee, it must be good to be king. Visitors will have to be able to walk around the garden. It's a, it's a way to generate income for the king, of course. It's, they will be charging it. And they're going to feature over 5,000 new yew tree hedging plants, including adult trees in various shapes and sizes. What he wants to basically do is sort of like what they were trying to do last week, where they basically stop mowing your lawn to create biodiversity um, habits for biodiversity environments, uh, butterflies and things. So all but he really, he really wants to do is topiatize them and he'll cut them into top, you know, whimsical shapes. If you've ever been to Walt Disney World, they have them everywhere. There are shapes of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and um, all kinds. I mean, it's actually, we used to work at Disney and the, the gardening is magnificent. I don't know how climate friendly it is when you have to keep trimming it into different shapes like swans and mice, but they're going to be cut into a variety of shapes because King Charles loves gardening. And it's going to feature more than 4,200 different kinds of plants and different species. And they're also going to create all different kinds of roses. And, and it will announce that the topiary garden will bring increased naturalistic planting to the area to improve biodiversity. Uh, you know, that's okay. I think it's funny, though. I mean, of all the things you could do as the king, is this what you're going to do? You're going to build a new garden with full whimsical shapes, kind of like an Alice in Wonderland experience? Um, okay, if that's what you want to do. I just remember how beautiful the gardens are of Queen Elizabeth and Buckingham Palace and, and Windsor. And, you know, they are they don't have the crazy uh, shape, shape things either. But, you know, that's what he wants. It must be good to be king. Um, I found another really funny article since we don't seem to have any comments or callers. Oh, darn. Um, so hopefully all of you can join in. But now I found another really silly article that I just couldn't stop. Uh, just shaking my head over. You know how they always talk about how baseball, you know, there's some artificial juicing that goes on with baseballs. It's the pitchers, it's the way they're holding the ball, are they putting special things on the ball to make them have more home runs? Are the, are the hitters using, you know, steroids to get more home runs? No, apparently the thing that is causing an increase in home runs this year, baseball home runs, global warming. A study by the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society looked at 60 years of baseball data. I guess they don't have anything else to do, right? And daily temperatures, finding that the air made thinner by warmer conditions, accounted for 1% home runs on average. So they increased the number of home runs by 1%. Couldn't possibly be that we have better hitters, stronger baseball players, none of those things. It has to do with global warming, right? That is expected to grow to 10% by 2100 as temperatures increase. So there's going to be a 10% increase in home runs in baseball due to global warming, making a baseball diamond into a prism of how lives will be impacted by climate change from recreation to health. Climate change is not just heat waves or hurricanes, said this scientist, a PhD science student, Christopher Callahan at Dartmouth College but rather through subtle changes in our leisure activities will start affecting people more and more in the ways we can't ex we don't expect. Now, I don't really know how increasing the number of home runs in baseball is going to affect our lives unless we're betting on it. But it is sort of silly to see that maybe, you know, is global warming really leading to baseball increase in home runs? Or is it just the fact that they're played sometimes on really hot, dry days, and maybe the pitchers and the hitters are just getting better, especially the hitters? Um, they think, however, this study from Dartmouth actually believes 
and I hard to have a hard time staying this with a straight face, that climate change is actually causing more home runs because warmer air is less dense than cold air and actually can increase the trajectory. And the air molecules of the ball is going to encounter less resistance and it's going to fly farther. Um, so this one director of the Penn Sci Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media, that's an interesting combination, don't you think? Says the analysis was solid, but suggests that heat stress may be another way to observe it, and that hotter temperatures may take a higher toll on pitchers who have to throw the ball farther. So maybe it's not the hotter temperatures leading to global warming. Maybe it's just that the hotter temperatures make the pitcher pitchers tired, and they're throwing better, worse balls, which then lead to home runs. Or also maybe is it just the pitchers are better or the hitters are better or the game is evolving as we learn more about good nutrition and, and, you know, and geometry of baseball and all that other stuff. So I just think it's funny that they're going to they're blame a home run derby uh, hits on climate change. Really? Um, is there nothing sacred anymore? And then my last funny thing uh, before we go to, to, to is that now they have actually bred a low methane sheep. And I have my little friends here in honor of global, in honor of uh, Earth Day, but I got this sheep in Copenhagen. It's a little, I have little animals that I count, I pick up stuffed animals as I, my travels. I have a kiwi from Australia. I have, I mean, from New Zealand. I have my little sheep from Copenhagen. But apparently now they're starting to breed low methane sheep in Britain. They're actually coming up with farmers are turning to genetic engineering to bring the emissions of sheep down. And they think they're trying to do it. They've, they're a new generation that now emits 16% less methane. But they don't necessarily know how that's going to affect. They hope it doesn't affect the taste of the meat. But I don't know if I want to have my sheep genetically modified. I mean, aren't we supposed to not do that either? So it's, again, it seems interesting that we've moved towards this wanting to have a clean food and clean green energy. But are we really going in that direction? I don't think so. Anyway, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Ball Brave TV network. You're watching the KJ Show, and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hey, welcome back to the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV Network. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host, and today I'm talking about heating versus eating and how the energy crisis is now working out its way into our food chain. Um, and the, the consensus has actually been now that cows are bad, uh, vegan stuff is good, except not so fast. Because now this Dutch scientist, back to the Dutch, are actually growing lab-cultivated beef in um, from st animal stem cells, and they're trying to figure out if that will replace 
an actual growing an actual cow. Um, and guess what? Cultivating lab beef in the lab causes 25 times more global greenhouse gas emissions. So we can't just grow dolly sheep and labs and clone them and all that stuff in the lab. Lab grown meat has been touted as a way to save the planet, they think. But I actually suggest its green credentials are less solid than many believe and that researchers have revealed that, revealed that lab grown or cultured meat produced by cultivating animal cells is 25 times worse for the environment than real cows. So I don't think we have a scientific solution for this food issue actually. And the production of real meat has a huge footprint because it revolves cows and you have to feed them and you have to clear land and you have to do water and all these things. Um, but they actually have done now thinking, oh, well, we'll just grow lab, you know, we'll just culture beef from stem cells. Um, but actually they think that if they do that, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions will actually increase because of the way it's produced. And even though they think it's more ethical because you're not actually slaughtering a real animal, um, they're concerned, of course, vegans won't touch it, but that they think that it has to do with multiple, the way in which it's produced actually creates more greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but they said, you know, so obviously it's not quite the solution. And I don't think I ever want to eat cultivated beef in a lab. Um, the problem is cows do emit greenhouse gas emissions, and that's one of the reasons they're looking for all these different ways to, you know, feed cows to not have them use or use masks yeah. or not have them, you know, do what cows do. But um, the global warming potential of lab-grown meat ranged from 246 to 1,500 kilograms of, of carbon, CO2 equivalent, compared to cows out there in the world. Um, lab grown meat is actually just not getting started and only Singapore has approved of it. So there's some real health concerns too. So I don't know if cultivating lab from beef stem cells is going to be a way to help with, with, uh, getting, you know, replacing beef in our diet. And then the other thing I ran across that was really fascinating to me is that it now finds out there's more and more studies coming out that say meat is actually crucial for human health. Uh, it, scientists have warned if they call for an end of the zealotry of pushing ve vegetarianism and vegan diets. Dozens of experts were asked to look at the science that behind the claims that meat, plant, eat, meat eating causes diseases and it's harmful to the planet. They actually were warned that it's difficult, actually, they disagreed. They said that it's hard to replace the nutritional value of meat and that when poor communities with low meat intake often suffer stunting, wasting, and anemia. So meat is actually good for you. And that there's widespread societal push towards plant-based diets, such as veg, you know, vegetarian meat-free Mondays, is going, is pulling the public away, but that's actually a bad idea. I know when my daughter went to college, um, they had uh, meatless Mondays and she hated it. I have a caller. Okay, hi, John, are you on the line? John? No, this is Carlo. Oh, hi, Carlo, how are you? Thank you for calling in. Do you hey, have a question? Dr. Johnson. You're welcome. I was just wondering, think? I was going to make a little like statement or so, but the United States has only been able to feed ourselves and export some food and produce to countries for only like a couple hundred years. So how, how are we going to maintain ourselves if people want to come and buy our land and then ship the produce that they produce on our land to their countries and we don't make any money or you know, yeah, that's so a good point. What you might add, any thoughts about that? Absolutely. In All fact, right, I I'll am. Hang up. Okay. Thank you, Carlo, for calling. Oh, actually, okay. no, that's a, bye that's bye. a great that's a great question. And actually, the the reason that's a concern is because yes, there. I think it's a move, and I hate to sound like some nut job, but it does seem that there is this movement afoot to control our food supply. And actually make sure that Americans have to, you know, it's it's um, controlled by the government. And that, you know, creates issues, especially if, you know, if we can't get our food supply to be secure, we're going to be in trouble if we're, we're at the beck and call of large agriculture or, or um, especially if they're supposed to ship their food to somewhere else like Indonesia or China or Vietnam. Or Netherlands, since they're not growing their own food, they don't want to grow their own food in the Netherlands anymore. It's a really important point. And I think that food security is just as important as economic security. 
And I'm worried that this push towards getting rid of livestock and getting rid of controlling our food supply is just another way in which they're controlling our lives. And I hate to sound like some, some lunatic, but you know, these are, these are, I'm not the only one with these concerns. In fact, scientists actually have now been pushing back on the notion that beef is bad for you. And that was what I was saying before our caller, um, that basically this meatless Mondays is really a bad, um, a bad notion. And, and, uh, and one of the problems is that, uh, they actually have said that meat supplies essential minerals and that unprocessed meat delivers, you know, all kinds of important vitamins and, and supplying vitamins that we human beings need, important compounds for metabolism, and and that the studies that have been touted that, you know, meat is bad, beef is bad, is actually now, they've proven, scientifically flawed. Where have we heard that before? I've already spoken about some of the scientifically flawed uh, studies that have pointed out to carbon dioxide and rising CO2 emissions. Well, guess what? This whole study that meat's bad has also been publicly debunked by over a hundred scientists. The Royal Co College of Surgeons and Dr. Alice Stanton said the peer-reviewed evidence reaffirms that the, 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 the study, the 2019 Global Burden Disease Risk Factor Report, which claimed that consumption of even tiny amounts of meat was bad, is fatally scientifically flawed. Now, these are doctors from Europe saying that these studies are wrong and that the fact is removing fresh meat and dairy from diets would be harmful to human health. Women, children, and elderly and low-income people would be particularly impacted. They say you still shouldn't eat a lot of meat, but, you know, you can buy, it's moderation. I think we should also have vegetables. Um, this new edition of, also said it was designed by a thousand scientists across the globe arguing that livestock farming is important to society to become, and, to, and it's was too important to society to become victims of zealotry. Think about that. A thousand scientists are saying we can't have these laws like they're trying to do in Holland, in which they've overturned, where we're going to eliminate farming, we're going to eliminate livestock. It's too important to the planet. So what's really important to the planet? Growing food or not eating or growing food in the lab. It's scary. It also says, especially for vulnerable populations like women and children and low income, that if they don't have meat in their diets, they're going to be more uh, at risk for, um, for diseases. And that beef actually helps contribute to the circular economy that everybody seems to be pressing for. It's uh, So one size fit all agendas, such as drastic reductions of livestock numbers, could incur environmental and nutritional consequences on a massive scale, according to a nutrition expert from the University of New Munich. It's not me saying this. These are scientists and experts who are worried that this zealotry is actually going to lead to harm, not benefits, all in the name of saving the planet. Interesting times we live in. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network. We'll be right back. Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com 
or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Hello, you're watching the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV Network, and I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host. Today we've been talking about heating versus eating, but I wanted to get to the fun stuff segment of my show, and it was um, Mother's Day last week, and it was also Earth Day not too long ago. In fact, I'm wearing a globe necklace that my mother wore um, often in my childhood, and so I thought, well, I'm worrying about saving the planet today. I'll put that on in honor of my mother. Um, but I also thought, you know, I didn't really talk about Earth Day too much, and the reason is... Well, I think Earth Day is sort of a sort of uh, not really a real holiday, and I was actually started in the '70s as a way to not observe Easter, which, as a Christian, I find rather offensive. But I decided, okay, I'm going to take a pot shot at Earth Day today, and I'm going to actually expose some of the myths that Earth Day has perpetuated. And by the way, the Environmental Protection Agency was formed because it was because of Earth Day. So, I mean, some good things come out of it too. But Earth Day, there was a lot of myths that come out about environmentalism, and I don't think there's enough people actually exploding these myths. So myth number one is plastic. All plastic can be recycled. Actually not true. Only certain types of plastic can be recycled, and that only curbside programs accept only a kind of like plastics that are beverage bottles, uh, milk jugs, detergent bottles, and yogurt containers. But that's not the only plastic that we have, right? We have all kinds of plastic. And so it's a myth that thinking that, you know, if we use plastic, if we switch, if we, you know, plastic's better for the planet, or maybe it's not better for the planet, but somehow we got this myth that plastic can be recycled and that's why it makes it okay to use it. Okay. I don't think so. Now, another myth, and this is right on point today with my show about heating versus eating is, guess what? The myth is organic crops are better for the environment. No, they're not. Apparently, organic crops, although they're painted as being good for the environment, but they're actually more harmful. Organic crops are not treated with pesticides, and they produce smaller yields and require more land than standard crops. So already they have problems. And then all the land requires more fossil fuels and harvest to yield. And increased demand can lead to deforestation. Organic crops have shorter life shelf space, shelf life, meaning food rots and then ends up in a landfill, which then emits, wait for it, methane. And um, also organic culture does not, does use pesticides if its own kind of pesticides that are more harmful than the synthetic pesticides. So organic farming is not the savior of our planet either. Another myth is that um, glass is better for the environment than plastic, apparently not. Uh, to reduce waste, many producers of started have stopped using plastic bottles in favor of glass. It may be well-intentioned, but it isn't helping the planet. Uh, glass requires more energy to manufacture. Glass is the worst packaging type when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. One study from the Danish Environmental Agency, again, this is not just me saying these things, that recycled plastic is actually the best, best packaging option uh, based on greenhouse gas emissions. And another really interesting myth was that most of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is a huge garbage thing out in, off the coast of Hawaii, is actually from single, they think it's from single-use items, when it's really not. This is a floating mass of plastic twice the size of Texas floating 100 miles off the coast of Hawaii. Um, most of that is abandoned fishing equipment. It has nothing to do with single-use plastic straws. Americans may use a lot of plastic, but very little of it ends up in the ocean. And we're only representing, we're only responsible for 1% of the plastic. 93% of ocean plastic can be traced back to eight rivers, seven, uh, 10 rivers, eight of those are in Africa. So Americans aren't as polluting as we think. And uh, there's a lot more things that we need to understand. So we shouldn't just take things at face value. Hopefully you've enjoyed this show. I know it's a little controversial, but I really think it's important when we start looking at the energy impacts that we also start thinking about the other ways in which energy impacts us and how does it going to impact the food we need. We need. We need heat and we need to eat. All right. Well, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host. You've been watching the Bold Brave TV Network uh, show, the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV Network. Hope you enjoyed the show and come back next week. 
This has been The KJ Show. Tune in next week as Catherine shares her insights to current changes in the energy industry while drawing on her experience as an energy efficiency consultant for the past 30 years. Right here on The KJ Show.